Hello, everyone. Welcome back. This is Valeria Lipovetsky, and you are listening to the Not Alone podcast. Today, I am so excited to present to you the conversation that I had with Nicole Lappin. If you don't know Nicole, uh, she is honestly such a trailblazer. She is the host of Money Rehab, which is the top 10 business podcast on Apple Podcast. She's also a New York Times and WSJ bestselling author and was the youngest anchor ever at CNN and CNBC before launching her own media company, Money News Network. And it's so important for me to bring women that are strong female figures in the financial space on the podcast, because I truly feel like we need to see more of that so we can continue the conversation and giving women and young women the tools they need uh, that haven't been provided to us yet. So this conversation, we dived into all things money, but also chatted about prenups and financial independence versus financial interdependence. Uh, And that one, is an interesting one, the importance of the folder. She brought forward a few concepts that I definitely adopted since um, and loved. And you know that we dived into the whole pros and cons of financial feminism. You know what I'm talking about, the who pays on the first date? I really wanted to get all these questions uh, answered with her because I really admire her voice and opinions. And I'm excited for you to hear this conversation. But before we get into it, I would appreciate if you could leave a review and rating for Not Alone on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. It really helps out the show, and I love reading your thoughts and feedback. If you're watching on YouTube, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Thank you so much for your support, and now let's dive in. so happy that you are here. I was so, I've been so excited to talk to you. Me too. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so <laughs> much for having me on. Thank you so much for what you're doing. I love your voice. I'm glad you found it. Thank you. I'm I'm still I'm still figuring it out, but I think that this podcast and these conversations are, you know, my kind of stepping stones to getting there. So, very honored to have women like you here to talk to. And I know that your background, I mean, I've seen you doing your news anchor on TV, but how did you get into finance? Oh my gosh, totally by accident. I actually lied to get my first job uh, in finance. So I grew up in an immigrant family, uh, never knew anything about money except like we used cash growing up. There was no discussion about a mortgage or credit cards or anything. Like I used checks going out to dinner with my girlfriends. I think a lot of first generation or immigrant families can relate to that. And so finance scared me so much. Like I freaked out when anyone was talking about finance. I had a boyfriend in high school who said he wanted to be a hedge fund manager and I thought he wanted to be in gardening. Like talk about the most clueless person ever. And so I needed a job when I was 18, needed to start working. And I wanted a job in broadcast news. And I stalked this station chief in Chicago who finally gave me an interview. And I wanted a job in local news uh, in Milwaukee. And so I was like, this is it. This is going to be my big break. And he's like, okay, you don't get the job in Milwaukee, but do you know anything about business news? And I tell you, like, I have hyperhidrosis, so I sweat a lot under my armpits. I had maxi pads (laughs) under my armpits at the time. I was like, yes, I love business news. Of course, I I know everything about it. Yes. And so I lied and I faked it till I made it. And I started on the floor of the Chicago Merck, which I thought was a mall at the time, but it's the stock exchange in Chicago. And I learned in the school of hard knocks, uh, the language of money. And I realized that money is a language, just like anything else. We just didn't learn that language. So once I learned it, I was like, oh, this is not that complicated. And then fast forward two decades, more than two decades later, um, I'm teaching other people how to do it. Never imagined I would get my own finances together, much less teach anyone else about it. That's incredible because I do think that money in general is a very, very big topic. And it is like you really have to take it back to your childhood, to upbringing, to understand the beliefs that you have around money. Like I'm still trying to work through mine because I very much grew up as 
same like you in an immigrant family. And money was always kind of like an evil thing that I didn't want to be associated with at all. I just kind of assumed it would flow, which will is also like a great belief, you know, just like manifesting it, it will just come, but I don't want to talk about it or touch it or, you know, think about it. So how was your relationship with money? What were your beliefs when you had to stop for a second and ask yourself? Oh my gosh, so much scarcity. So I grew up in a really broken home. Um, My father died of a drug overdose when I was 11. Um, My mother, I needed to bail her out of jail, um, which I talk about in one of my books, uh, Miss Independent, using cash under the sink um, when I was in middle school. And so like, I have serious financial trauma around money. And I think we all do. Like, you might say, okay, well, it's not as serious as that necessarily. But if it's serious to you, it's serious. And it's probably standing in a way, in the way of a lot of your financial hopes and goals and dreams because it's not dealt with. And even if you didn't have you know, family trauma, maybe your friend group spent a lot of money, got into debt, or even on a macro level, like you lived through the housing crash. I saw my house get foreclosed on. So that has like led to all of this housing insecurity and housing trauma or the dot-com bubble or, you know, the pandemic most recently. And so I think we all have like a lot of financial shit, like so Mm -hmm. much financial shit that's standing in the way of very basic stuff. Because once you get through that, once you clear away some of those cobwebs or like deal with it or do some of that work, uh, the financial, personal finance is so easy. People say like, I don't know math. I can't do it. I started as a poetry major, Valeria. Like (laughs) I could do it. Anyone could do it. I promise. Like I didn't know math. You know, the, the three things people say as excuses to not get their financial life together is I don't know math. I don't have enough money to start and I'm too old. Okay. Like Mm -hmm. again, you fifth grader can do the math. Your sons can do the math uh, that's required to get your personal financial. Chat GPT can do the math. A hundred percent. Both of them could. Your your son using chat GPT could could figure out your personal finances. Mm -hmm. Uh, You you don't need a lot of money to start. You need the most time possible. Mm -hmm. And you're never as young as you are today. So as far as I'm concerned, if you haven't started yet, today is as good a day as any. So was it the environment, like to take it back to your own beliefs, was it the environment that made you change those beliefs and start looking at money in a different way? What was it? I think that it was out of necessity. Like I had no choice. I had no backup plan. I had no fallback plan. Like I had no couch to go home to if it failed. So that's why I needed to get a job at at all costs. And, you know, Mm -hmm. I don't hate on people that have the luxury to like do what they love, but like, I didn't have the luxury to do what I love. If I did what I loved, I'd be sitting under a tree writing poetry all day long. But like the practical applications of jobs are that you have to make money, right? Like I needed money. I needed to pay the bills. And so I didn't, you know, have the luxury of going out and doing what I loved, you know, as you hear a lot of entrepreneurial experts say, which bothers me so much because I'm like, cool, that's 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 such a privilege to be able to do that. Um, but there's no shame in like feeding your family, paying your bills, like working to make money, you need money to live. Uh, mm-hmm. And so I ultimately found my dream job, but it was the very same job that I had. It wasn't what I expected. I found the things that I loved doing and the opportunities that I had. And I found the shaded part of that Venn diagram. And I hate a ton of stuff we learn in school, as I'm sure you're seeing. Like, I wish we learned budgeting. I wish we learned how to do a business plan. Those would have been much more practical applications than like an isosceles triangle or a parallelogram. (laughs) Um, Or like when what train gets to what station at whatever time. And, you know, I think Venn diagrams were important to learn in school. And what I did was I found that shaded part. And, um, you know, I loved writing and I and I loved helping people and I loved communicating. But I had this job in finance that at first I thought was so evil. And I was like helping old rich white men get richer. And I was like, oh, I'm not doing anything with my life. And then I, you know, and then I rethought what that opportunity was and I made it something that I loved. Hi, guys, let's chat real quick about one of today's sponsors, Peak. If you follow me on social media, you know that I am in such a toxic relationship with coffee and we are broken up now. Like, and I'm never going back there. It's not a good relationship for me. So I was on the market for a new matcha and came across a duo that peaked, pun intended, 
my interest. I found the Radiant Skin Duo from Peak, which includes a matcha and some electrolytes that do all the things that you would expect a matcha and electrolytes to do, but together they are formulated to be a comprehensive skincare powerhouse for brighter and radiant skin. The Radiant Skin Duo combines powerful plant extracts and science-backed ingredients into delicious drinks. It includes the Sun Goddess Matcha and BT Fountain, and they work together to get your skin looking more radiant and glowy. It has green tea antioxidants, the clinically proven ceramides to help reduce fine lines and boost skin elasticity. It has chlorophyll, which is known to help clear skin and moisture boosting hyaluronic acid. BT Fountain contains bioavailable electrolytes and minerals, so it helps with any brown, so it helps with any, so it helps with brain, f I need that one right now. Where is it? Give me the BT Fountain Youth. The electrolytes and minerals help combat brain fog and provide deep cellular hydration. The Sun Goddess matcha is the highest quality matcha ever. I've been using the peak matcha for a while, so I am standing by it. It's organic, ceremonial grade, and quadruple toxin screened for purity. Hydrate from the AM to PM with Peak's Radiant Skin Duo. Enjoy fresh notes of Japanese yuzu and BT fountain and a creamy umami taste of sun goddess matcha. So if you want to give Peak a try, head over to peaklive.com slash Valeria to get 15% off plus free shipping for life and receive Peak's starter kit. That's P-I-Q-U-E-L-I-F-E dot com slash Valeria for 15% off plus free shipping for life and Peak's starter kit, which includes a frother and a beaker. It's so funny how you mentioned, you know, all these uh, advice of like, do what you love. I think it was Professor Galloway who said, the people that tell you to do what you love are rich. Yes, the totally. rich people tell you to, to go <laughs> trust and fun, work baby. Yeah. your dream career, uh, which is very interesting. Actually, talking about school, I've looked at the curriculum for my kids, like my eldest is going to sixth grade, and they're going to read Rich Dad, Poor Dad this year, which is phenomenal. Like the fact that there is some kind of shift to introduce them into okay. finance at sixth grade. I was like, okay. Something I, I is shifting. <laughs> no, I, I definitely love, I think that finance should absolutely be taught in school. Like mm-hmm. I've been saying this for years and then I finally did something about it. I started the money school, which is going to be um, my next book coming out next year. And so I was like so tired of just complaining about this. I was like, I have to do something about it. But but absolutely, mm-hmm. it's incumbent. Like you're not going to learn it in school. And that's a good excuse to bury your head in the sand. Like you didn't learn it in school. That's absolutely right. But that is only hurting yourself. And, you know, it is incumbent if you're not going to learn it uh, at school on the parents to, to teach some of these lessons. Uh, but, you know, if you're like me, I didn't learn it at home either. And at some mm-hmm. point you can say, well, like, woe is me. That sucks. Like, I nobody taught me. But then, you know, at some point you put your big girl pants on and you're like, well, I have to teach myself or I'm only going to hurt myself for the rest of my life. I think that's what it is right now with money and finance in general. We have a lot of like emotional attachment to it. And in a way, we kind of think we're either good at it or we don't. It's a very fixed mindset. And mm-hmm. starting to look at it as just, a toolbox that you need to acquire is just creating it, like making it become something that you just learn and navigate as you get better at it. It's nothing that's just you either have it or you don't. Um, but it's very interesting to me to hear from you in terms of you know getting into finance and the role of the financial independence in your own empowerment. Like, what did it do? for you as a young woman? Wow. Well, I started in a ton of credit card debt. Um, You know, I ate brown rice and beans because it felt fancier than ramen. Like I've been, I've been poor and, um, and I've also been rich and I have to say that having money is more fun. Um, But, you know, I think for me, ultimately, uh, getting my own financial life together was the power to leave a bad job, leave a bad situation. You know, um, the women who reach out to me who say like, and I could, I could almost cry, um, thinking about this, but 
that they leave abusive relationships finally mm-hmm. um, because they have those financial tools. Like you said, they're, they're just tools. Money can be used for good or evil. Like a hammer can be used to build or tear down a house. It's how you use it. And so money can be used to control people. Uh, and, and in terrible financial situations, there's tons of financial abuse that goes on and, and women are scared to make their own money or, or handle their own money. And and for me, it was it was that opportunity to be able to like leave any situation. I ultimately left my job at CNBC when I was 27. And that was like a big job. And I was making six figures at the time. And I was like, you know, where, where people would have, it, it, you know, wish they could have been. And my former self was completely shocked that I got there to begin with, but it was like a bad situation for me. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and having my own money finally allowed me to burn my corporate bra go out on my own and try to reach the people that, you know, were my former self, the girl who was too scared to join money conversations. I didn't want to talk to those old rich white men about money. They had like enough young girls telling them what the dad was doing. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to do, you know, finally I was able to do more of what I loved because I had the money and the, the opportunity and the freedom to do that. I often think back to my own childhood, just watching my mother who was, throughout my childhood, a single mom. And I often connected back to the question, like if she had the financial independence, what choices would Mm -hmm. she have made different, right? Because there is, it's such a controlling power. And especially back then for a lot of women, it wasn't it wasn't even a choice. There was no other way. You just, you had to be under that, you know, um, under that kind of oppressive movement. And I think that because of that, I always looked at money as a scary thing. And it only happened recently when Now that I have my own company and I make money, that I understand the beautiful power of money. So I can only imagine how your the education that you put out there for free for women to consume is life changing for them. Thank you. Thank you. Is that your is that your why? Why? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's the it's the whole reason that I I do what I do every single day. It's you know, I, I want other people to not have to make the same mistakes I did. I make, I made ton of tons of them. I talk about them very openly and honestly, and it took me a long time to figure out my voice too. So I really resonate when you talk so openly and honestly about that, because for a long time, when I was in news, like I tried to whitewash my story and I tried to like make Mm -hmm. everything veneered and like, you know, only tell half of it. Like I didn't lie, but like I wasn't telling the full story. And I was like, oh my gosh, people are going to find me out. Like I didn't work at a bank or I didn't go to business school. Like, you know, they're going to think I'm a fraud. And I had so much imposter syndrome and all of that. And then finally I was like, fuck this. I should talk about all the ways I messed up along the way. Like the, I, I am an expert in what it's like to have money because I'm an expert in what it's like to not have money. And Amen. those stories are much Amen. more interesting. Okay, let's pause and chat real quick about one of today's sponsors, Green Chef. Tackling the workload and honestly mental load of meal planning, shopping, prepping, and cooking is not a task that I love to do. I have enough going on in my life and not even to mention how much more challenging it can be if you're trying to eat organic foods. But then I found Green Chef, a certified organic meal kit company with plenty of options for special diets, which include keto, paleo, vegan, and gluten-free. The variety is incredible, uh, which I love. There's a lot of really cool flavor combination like harissa apricot chicken. You got some Moroccan shrimp bisque. You can get very adventurous. And it's important to note that the back to school season is notorious for setting all of us back because there's so much to pay attention to and keep up with, but don't let it set back your nutrition. Green Chef is making it easy to stick to your healthy eating habits with a new, more flexible menu featuring over 35 customizable recipe options 
every week. Some of the new options include doubling your portion of protein or veggies or swapping to a plant-based protein like organic tofu. Green Chef has over 15 recipes every week to support dairy-free, gluten-free, vegetarian, and vegan lifestyle. Also have to mention that I absolutely love the fact that most of the recipes are ready in 25 minutes or less. And when I tell you Green Chef is really trying to make it easy and motivating for all of us, I'm not joking. Uh, Green Chef is working with ClassPass to support you even further. So for a limited time, new Green Chef subscribers will also receive 50 free credits to use at ClassPass, which is about a month's worth of membership. So you'll have Green Chef, healthy recipes, and access to thousands of gyms and fitness studios through ClassPass. They even have a dedicated preference for gut and brain health with science-backed recipes that features ingredients like fiber, antioxidants, and omega-3 fatty acids. The future is here. Each box is packed with food that you can feel good about, like whole fruits and vegetables, plus lean protein and whole grain options. Go to greenchef.com slash Valeria class for 50% off your first box, plus 50 free credits with ClassPass. That's greenchef.com slash Valeria class to get 50% off your first box, plus 50 free ClassPass credits. That's G-R-E-E-N chef dot com slash Valeria class green chef the number one meal kit for eating well yesterday I was talking to my friend and she was saying how we we're talking about the fact that there's so many experts out there that give a really glossy great in theory advice but it's the ability to recognize the ones that went through it in order to share the actual, you know, steps and tools that they acquired, that's where the focus needs to be. Like those are the people that need to be heard more than anyone else. I mean, sister, I walked through hell and fire and my mission and my why was bringing back buckets of water for those still caught in the flames. Do you feel like you've been healing kind of yourself throughout the journey from all that past that you've been carrying? Absolutely. It is a lifelong journey. I mean, we've had a lifelong of bad habits. Only a lifetime of good habits are going to counteract that. So when people say like, oh, I've figured it out, like I found balance or I found, you know, happiness or whatever, like it's, you know, under the couch there somewhere, like it's a noun. I think of it more of as a verb, the, the, the poet in me, like really cares about the language that we use. And, you know, it's, it's something that's constantly in motion. It's something you constantly have to work on every single day. Like I still, I've written, I'm on my fifth book. Um, you know, I have a daily podcast for personal finance. I have a whole network of personal finance podcasts. Like I've been doing this for, you know, more than 20 years. I have the the cred and all of that. And still, Valeria, it doesn't matter what's in my bank account. Like I could have mm. all the zeros in my bank account, but I still have this irrational fear of being broke, alone and homeless and dying in the gutter completely irrational. Like, and I'm still open and honest about it because you never get to a point where like that goes away. I honestly, I talk to Gary, my husband, about it all the time. It's generational trauma. It's so much bigger than just this lifetime. You know what I mean? Like we're carrying so much of the wounds. And I mean, I don't want to get too, uh, you know, deep in here, but we carry a lot of that from our grandparents. Like mm -hmm. I remember the energy in the household when money was talked about. So I carry that subconsciously everywhere I go. Yeah. Uh, you, we all do. And I think it's, you know, the first step to any recovery, all of my books are 12 step plans is admitting you have a problem and the ones you can't fix are the ones you don't admit you have. And we all have problems. And I think it's, mm -hmm. it's the day that you start to confront them is the first day of the rest of your wealthy, rich life. And, and when I say rich, I, I mean, in all aspects of the word, uh, mm -hmm. a rich, full life. Money can afford you a lot of, it can't buy you happiness necessarily, but can buy you a lot of resources and tools and help to get you a, a step closer to some of the components of happiness, which as you know, have been studied to be experiences and helping others and, you know, buying back your own time. Mm -hmm. You know what? I'm always curious to understand um, and hear people's experiences when it comes to the impact of money on relationships, both positive and negative. But do you have 
any moments where, especially when you gained your financial independence, that it started affecting certain friendships or relation, romantic relationship, family relationship? Well, I changed my idea of financial independence. And I wrote a book, Miss Independent. But even since I wrote that book, I think that what's a healthier mindset is being interdependent. And I don't Mm -hmm. think in any relationship, it's a good thing to be dependent, right? Codependent is one side of the spectrum. And then independent is the other side of the spectrum. Independent is the other side of the spectrum. And interdependent is right in the middle, I think. I think we need people. Like we we feed off people. And, uh, and I think that those are the things that stand in the way of uh, us talking about finances is the interpersonal connections and relationships. It's not the math and the numbers. It's like, how do I get my friend to pay me back for something? How do I talk to my significant other about a prenup? Like, how do I, you know, how do I deal with like financial infidelity? Those are the things that like, you know, mess us up. Those are the things that stand in, in our way more than anything else. Like it's not the numbers. I, that's just an excuse. It's the humanities part. That's that's most challenging. I do find, and I've experienced it myself, that when women are starting to make money, the energy and the dynamic in the household is shifting. And again, not necessarily in a negative, nothing is negative or positive. It's just, it's just moving around and just trying to distribute your, itself in different ways. Have you experienced that? I think that once you start making money as a woman, uh, you deal with a lot less bullshit mm-hmm. from 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 relationships, from jobs, uh, you know, from from friends. I I don't think that it contributes to worth in the way that people are concerned about talking about money, like. You know, I talk about all my salaries that I made very openly and honestly. And like I say what I made for my books because I'm like, somebody's going to wonder, like, if she tells people to talk about money, like, what is she making? And so I'm like, cool, (laughs) I'll show you mine. No big deal. You know, and I think that people are nervous to have those conversations because they associate money with this self-worth. And it's not. It just is. Like, if we help each other, if we open up more and we start talking about money, if we say, like, you know, I'll go to dinner with my girlfriends and we'll talk about everything, as I'm sure you do, like sexy time, bikini waxes, bowel movements, like nothing is off limits. Mm -hmm. And then I'll say, you know, what are you making? Or, you know, what's in your bank account now? Or how are you investing? And it's crickets. I'm like, girl, you just told me about your landing strip. And this is, this is, taboo like this is crickets I think it's our still our last taboo and 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 women will say like but I'm not making as much money so I don't feel you know worthy enough and I'm like that's on you boo like that you Mm. have to you have to do your work around what money is to you because I think unless we start talking about it we're never going to make more it's like trying to price your house without knowing the comp of the area right we're just shooting in the dark and I think once we can start opening up really honestly, even with our friends, like it it doesn't have to be, you know, broadcast like I do. Um, Then I think, I think we're all going to win. Yeah. Like creating the space for those conversations. So it's not so scary and uh, fearful. I agree. What is, what is money to you? How do you look at it? To me, I think money is a tool to be able to pursue freedom and happiness. I think it's the most powerful uh, tool of them all to do, um, you know, ultimately whatever I want. Like you can't buy peace, right? But Mm -hmm. you can buy therapy. Uh, You can't buy genius or brilliance, but you can buy classes. You can't buy health, right, Valeria, but you can buy great health care. You know, you can't buy culture and friendship and time and sleep and appetite, but you can buy a first class ticket for yourself and your best girlfriend to go to Paris, stay in a great hotel with a fluffy, comfy bed and eat croissants all day long while your assistant holds down the fort back home. I mean, that's that's what it is to me. It, it's not going to buy you those things, but it's going to afford you the best chance of getting them. I started looking at it as like, this is the this is the thing that can buy me time because time is our greatest currency. And, you know, money is I can exchange money for time. And that to me, when I made that shift in my head, I started looking at it as this is an amazing tool that doesn't control my life, but that can 
benefit my life greatly. I'm okay without it too. And I also, I have this thing. It's the weirdest thing. I grew up in a, again, in like a household where obviously money was talked about all the time and there was always not enough of it. But I am in this like the Lulu thinking that I'm just, I'm always going to be okay, no matter what. Like, it's the weirdest thing. I don't know where, where I got that kind of like a confidence from, you know? I love that for you. I have the complete opposite mindset. I'm like, everything, oh, we're, everything we're going to lose everything. Like, it's all going to be gone tomorrow. That's my husband. My <laughs> husband is that. I'm always like, no, no, we'll figure it out. You know, you mean money balance. comes, money goes. He's like, no, this is the end. There's a balance between like, where's a healthy zone for that, right? Because some people think they're going to live forever and some people operate with finances like they're going to die tomorrow. And neither one mm. is like the best extreme to play in. Like hoarding money, like holding on to it so tightly, that's like not good vibes and energy for many. I do believe like not to get woo woo around this, but like I do believe that there's a law of attraction around money and that money has energy. Oh, and like absolutely. you hoard it, like it's not going to come back to you. And so, but at the same time, like you don't want to spread frivolously and you have kids and you have stuff that you're saving for. And so, so I think there's, there's some, somewhere in between I'm going to live mm -hmm. forever and I'm going to die tomorrow is... You know, I saw this uh, TikTok of, um, it, it's a couple and the guy, he tells his wife, if I'm dying tomorrow, how are you going to pay for the house? Who is our mortgage? Who is mm. our insurance company? Who is the car? And she's like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't. That gave me such like a urgency to, I literally ran out of the room and I was like, Gary, sit down. <laughs> Who is our provider? Where's our insurance? And he was like, what is happening? But I've realized that, you know, in a relationship, when it comes to finance and all these like adulting, um, it's totally understandable that between, you know, a man and a woman, we can carry everything ourselves. So there is definitely this, you know, sharing of the mental load and the family load. Absolutely. But I, ha I do have to recognize that a lot of women are not aware and don't know a lot of these things, which is kind of scary to me. It's super scary. Um, I had, who did I have? Ben Higgins, I think on the show. He was from The Bachelor and he was talking about this folder that he has for his wife. And it's like the red folder or something. And he's like, don't look at it. Like if something happens, God forbid, like all of the stuff is in there. And I think that's, you know, I think it's it's more important to have those conversations, right, mm -hmm. uh, earlier um, and not, you know, when you have to. Proactively is hard, with especially with finances, to have these conversations. Reactively, that's when a lot of women uh, have to get their financial lives together when their husband dies or they get a divorce because they have no choice. Um, and, the, and the reality mm -hmm. is uh, men do control. Even with women who worked in financial services, uh, We've had so many stories of of women who've, you know, left marriages with nothing because they let somebody else control it. And that also happens with financial advisor situations and other situations. When you mm -hmm. relinquish control, you know, ultimately, even if somebody is helping you, you need to understand what's going on because nobody is going to care as much about your finances as you are. But having a folder or something like that, I think as, at the very least is a good practice. Yeah. yeah, we had uh we we went away on uh on a little like trip just him and I and he sat me down and he's like there is a folder at the bottom of the safe and the folder speaking of wow. the folder and the folder has this and this and if I die this is the life insurance and this is who you call and this is what you do and I was just sitting there and I'm like I can't believe like this is my love language like this is so sexy yeah. why is <laughs> why is no one talking about that kind of connection you know it was very special because i think for women i mean everyone is obviously looking in their partners for different things but for me as a woman i need to feel that safety and that safety is what allows me you know to show up and do my job so it really felt so comforting. And I started telling all my friends that I was like, I don't know if you guys talked about it, but go and do the folder. So I, I actually wanted to mention it because I think that's brilliant. You guys, let's talk about one of today's sponsors, Haya. I don't know if you're aware, but as a mother, I've noticed that many kids' vitamins out there contain around two to five grams of sugar, along with other gummy junk and 
very hard to pronounce chemicals. It's like candy in disguise. That's why Haya was created, the pediatrician-approved superpower chewable vitamins for kids. Haya fills in the most common gaps in our children's diets to provide the full body nourishments that our kids need with great taste they love and zero sugar. It is formulated with the help of nutritional experts and they press the blend of 12 organic fruits and vegetables, then super supercharged with 15 essentials, vitamins, and minerals, and that includes the vital D, B12, C, zinc, folate, and many others to help support immunity, which is first, I don't know about you, but that's the most important to me, energy, brain function, concentration, teeth, bones, and more. It's non-GMO, vegan, dairy-free, allergy-free, gelatin-free, nut-free, and everything else you can imagine. Haya is designed for kids to and up and sent straight to your door so parents have one last thing to worry about. I got my first order in and it comes in like a really cute box and a bottle that you keep and you can decorate the bottle. I feel like that was a really nice intro for the boys to get into the high of vitamins. I didn't have to push for it. Once they played with the bottle, you know, made it their own and then opened it up, took the vitamins and we moved on with our day. I also recommend checking out their new kids probiotics and nighttime essentials. We've worked out a special deal with with Haya for their best-selling children's vitamin, receive 50% off your first order. To claim this deal, you must go to hayahealth.com slash Valeria. This deal is not available on their regular website, so you need to go to H-I-Y-A-H-E-A-L-T-H.com slash Valeria and get your kids the full body nourishment they need to grow into healthy adults. Did you have any uh, conversations with your friends? Like your friends came to you, it's like, hey, how do I navigate money talk in a relationship? It's one of the biggest causes of fights. It's one of the biggest causes of divorces. Uh, you know, couples will talk about just like friends, uh, just about everything before you talk about money. And it's, I think it changes throughout a course of a relationship, right? So when you and Gary were dating, I'm sure the conversations were not about life insurance. So, uh, no. you know, as you grow in your relationship, so does a money talk. And when you have kids, like, you know, it's not fun and sexy to talk about a will, but you have to, if you have kids, you have to have to have a will and an advanced directive and all mm -hmm. this other adulting stuff, as you say. But I think early on, you want to get a sense of like what somebody's money habits are. And having a conversation about money doesn't have to be an interrogation. It's not like putting a flashlight in your eye, like being like, where were you, you know, this night, blah, 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 blah. like show me your 401k, show me your statement. What's your credit score? Like you're, you know, do you have STDs in the same type of, you know, tone? You can get a glass of wine. It can be like a fun, sexy conversation. You're talking about your hopes and dreams. And I think that that's what I'd love people to take away from this is that goals have price tags. And so, First, talking mm. about this idea of what those goals are and then reverse engineering to figure out how to get the money to live that life, not the other way around, because it's really arbitrary. Like, you know, whether somebody has a million dollars or a hundred thousand dollars or, you know, a hundred dollars, it, it's completely dependent on like the lifestyle you want. So when somebody says to me, yes, all I want is, is a million dollars. If I had a million dollars in my bank account, like I would feel safe and I would feel happy. And I'm like, cool. What do you want to do with that million dollars? Like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Maybe you need more than a million dollars. Maybe you need less. Like, I have no idea what you would do with that million dollars. A million dollars as a number in a vacuum means nothing. Like, do you guys want to fly private around the world, you know, once a year? Like, a million dollars is not enough. Do you want to sit in a lawn chair from Target, like, outside? Like, a million dollars might be too much. And so I think it's it's really important to, like, frame those conversations, especially early on, about what you want your life to look like. And they don't need to be the same, but it has to be compatible. Yeah. I also love that through this conversation of even the hypothetical question, if you had a million dollars, what would you do with it? You learn a lot about a person's value system, like what they value, what's important to them. And that is such a wonderful way to both cover the money aspect and, you know, get into that, but also understand if your values are aligned. Because money, it's, you know, I was under the impression that if 
we don't talk about it, it'll just, it will never be a problem in my life. Like it was mm. in my, you know, parents' life. Cause that was, again, the source of a lot of disagreements. Yeah. So I'm like, if I just don't talk about it, I'll be fine. And, you know, when I married Gary, Gary was already financially stable entrepreneur. So I was like, okay, he got this. But obviously, as to your point, as you get older and mature and, you know, I started building my own thing, there's no way to escape it. It's just such a part of life. Um, and bringing in the money conversation has changed the way I feel about myself. Like I feel so much more empowered and so much more uh, informed. And I think maybe that's even the, the where the mm-hmm. Delulu is coming from, where it's like, I'm going to figure it out. Everything's going to be okay. No matter what happens. I mean, I don't think these conversations are the enemy of romance. I think the spirit is exactly what you said that you went away with Gary. Like you and your partner are connecting on this other level. And so, uh, you know, I think reframing your idea about this, especially with prenups, like, you know, women who are scared of prenups, I say, bring back that conversation, like take it back and own it. Like we're marrying later. Mm -hmm. Um, women should bring up a prenup. Like the thing that scares you most, like wonder what, where is that coming from? And why am I so scared of this? And why have I been told to be scared of this? Or like, why is this something that's going to hurt me? I think that, you know, you ultimately, you have a prenup anyway, whether you create one or not, the state decides for you. And so I think in general, like you don't want the state to decide anything in your your personal life. So taking control of that yourself is really important. Prenup was a funny thing for me because I also grew up looking at it just the way I saw it in the movies as this thing is like, oh, you want a prenup? You don't love me. And end of relationship. Uh, That's all I knew about it. And when Gary and I got engaged and um, we did talk about prenup, I went to speak to a lawyer and I was like, what is this? How am I gaining from it? What is, how is it protecting me? And I've learned so much about the power, again, it's empowering to know where you stand. Um, so I'm I'm a big prenup like cheerleader. Yeah, yeah. Here. I mean, look, we uh, have health insurance. We don't think about that as like death planning, right? We get car insurance. We don't think about that mm-hmm. as like crash planning. You know, I think it's th- th- nothing screams we're mature adults louder than frank discussions about your future and finances. Absolutely. Uh, how has it been? I always wonder when I see women like yourself, you are, you know, very strong energy, you know, who you are financially independent. How was it dating as this woman? (laughs) Because I can only imagine the landscape. Oh, it's a great question. Uh, I think once going back to the idea of once you have money, you deal with a lot less bullshit. Um, But I always, uh, you know, felt like I wanted a man to pay for a first date. Always. I've never Mm -hmm. paid for a first date, um, not because I can't pay for a first date. And I think that's a huge difference, like wanting somebody to do it because you feel safe and secure. And like I, I, you know, I'm a boss at work all day long. But in my personal relationship, I'm like very much in my feminine energy. Um, And that allows me to like get in my feminine energy. And by the way, I'm not telling other women like don't split the the bill. Do whatever you want. I think being the ultimate feminist is not telling women what to do, but saying like, you do you, girl. And for me, I'm really honest that that's what worked for me. Um, I've I've never split. Uh, I've never split the bill uh, on a first date. Um, I think that it was never ambiguous whether or not it was a date or not. I think sometimes money can be used like to distance, right? Like you could do it as like, oh, this is a friend mm. thing or not. But yeah, you know, somebody. We were doing an episode about this uh, on another show I do with the editor in chief of Entrepreneur Magazine, and we were we were discussing like who pays on a first date, and our producer thought that uh, that Jason was going to say the man pays, and I was going to say split, and it was the absolute opposite. Uh, and I think that there's something like really empowering to say. Uh, you know, I can pay for the dinner. I can pay for the whole restaurant probably, but like, I don't want to touch that bill. Mm -hmm. Did you feel like you had to, because that's the sense that I have from speaking to my single girlfriends. Um, They feel like there's been so much progress for women and 
kind of owning their lives and where they're going and what they want. And they feel like men haven't really caught up yet. Uh, now, I'm not trying to make this like totally. divide between men, women, whatever. No, it's just that's how they feel. They're like, we feel like we need to re-educate men in order for them to understand like what we want because it is confusing for them right there we just had all these years of you know you are courting a woman and you're paying for it and you kind of the dominant the relationship to all of a sudden you know with the feminism like if you open the door you are you know you're disrespecting me if you're paying the bill you're disrespecting me they kind of don't know where they stand have you ever felt that when you were out there in the wild <laughs> Um, you know, I, I think that there is, there is some masculinity confusion for sure. Uh, but I, I know for me, I was like, I can pay for myself. I just don't want to like call it reparations for the wage gap, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, there yeah. have been. I'm paying the bank <laughs> tax. Right. Okay. So you can pay for this. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think like if he reaches for the check for me again, like this just worked for me. And I, I also was confused in my early career, like hearing these while, while I was, you know, working and dating, like hearing these different narratives of like, um, you know, you should split or he shouldn't open or whatever. And like, I don't know, you go through your own, like figuring it out. And this is what I figured out works for me. I like, he reaches for the check or it's paid like before there's no check, like it's paid when he goes to the bathroom or something. Like, I think that is sexy. I think that confidence mm -hmm. also in just like knowing that that's what I look for in a relationship that comes from a really deep seated, like, you know, concern of safety and stability and, and all of these things that like, you know, make me who I am today. I, I wouldn't change like all the crap that I've gone through. It's, it's absolutely, you mm -hmm. know, become my superpower. I thought it they were my weaknesses for so long. Um, but I can't deny that that's like what makes me feel good in a relationship. And so I think everybody has a journey for themselves to figure out what that is. And there's definitely a lot of confusion. A lot of confusion, but I always champion like women to speak on what they want. I think that men appreciated more than you know they just want a direction <laughs> they're just like just tell me what will make you happy and I'll do it I'll show up you know what I mean and if they don't then totally. it's not the person for you I mean that's the easiest yeah, decision to make there's uh there, there's there's plenty of others out there that's like it is as soon as I started being really clear about what I want that's when I was bringing in like the people that I really wanted but for I was like I don't know like he can be whatever religion, like he can have kids, he can not have kids, like it's fine. And then I was like, no, I want somebody Jewish. I want somebody no kids. Like I was very, very clear. And like, this is my person. And that's, you know, mm -hmm. ultimately my person. And I, and I think that we all like work through what that, what that looks like, but there was some meme or something that was like the difference between men and women on a hot day. The man says like, I want ice cream. The woman's like, wow, it's like, it's so hot. I wonder like, you know, maybe a nice treat would be, would be so refreshing right now. Like you want them to, it's like a Madelib or something, right? Yeah. But there yeah. is confidence and there, I think it is sexy to be able to articulate clearly what you want. But first you have to figure out what that is. You and that's the journey. That's the journey you have to go with yourself to get to a place of clarity. Once it's clear, then you need to learn to communicate it in a way where you know it's clear enough. Because a lot of this, like, well, I don't know, yeah. no, that doesn't work. Uh, from experience, it does not work. And um, I definitely think that being more vocal and it doesn't mean that you're being demanding. I think that's another thing. There's so many ways that we need to change the way we think about these behaviors as controlling or demanding or you know those are those are just signals you're just signaling it's a green light or a red light or a yellow light that's all they need to know it's a they're a car <laughs> and they just need to know do I go do I stay do I wait do I turn <laughs> it's pretty simple um you know you mentioned earlier how you are in your private life you are very much more in your feminine and before this conversation, I was thinking about money. And the first thing that came to my mind was like, money feels like it has a very masculine mm. energy. And you spend, I mean, a lot of time talking about money and finance. How do you navigate 
that balance? Hmm. I think that it's coming up with also clear roles in, in whatever that looks like for you. If you're, if you're talking about your personal relationship when it comes to that feminine energy, like I think you can be strong and feminine. It's not about being weak. Um, you can come mm-hmm. to the table as a partner who understands these things. I think it's, you know, the best partnerships is also like when you truly understand like what somebody's talking about and can cont- contribute. Um, uh, but, but yeah, I think in general, uh, I, I think money can be masculine, feminine, whatever you want it to be. It's not, you know, like you said, not inherently good, not inherently bad. It's it's truly like what you make it. Like it doesn't, it all this other shit that we put on it is like all of our own stuff, all of our own baggage. Like money yeah. just is like, we all need to use money. There's like two truisms. We all have a mother, we're all born and we all need money. To, to operate in this world. We all mm-hmm. touch money every single day. And so being scared of it is, uh, you know, it, it is some is coming from somewhere else. It's like not money's fault. Money didn't do that to you. Uh, money, money is yeah. like ultimately innocuous, right? It's, it's, uh, it's how you use it in the way that you, uh, operate within the world of it that, uh, colors it for you. So when you leave your work and you get home, how do you like, okay, we had enough of that masculine energy that is beautiful and benefited me so much today. And now I need to lean into here. How do you do that? Oh, um, <laughs> I've, I've. I no, I'm it's a hard question because we don't think about it, right? We don't actually to me, I've realized only like three, four months ago that because I've been sitting and talking about feminine energy and all that stuff for so long. And I've only realized recently that I'm bringing this CEO, uh, you know, boss bitch energy home. And I don't want to. That's not good for my relationship. But it's it's already, you know, we we kind of go into this autopilot. So it's very hard to break that, okay, enough and lean into that more soft. And when I say submissive, I don't want to say submissive in a negative way, but just like, like, lead me, you know, like, I- I'm ready. I'm fine. I re- I've already led yeah, during I'm the tired. day. Now I just <laughs> like, need someone to take the wheel. <laughs> I'm tired. Thanks. And I feel the same way. That's, you know, how my relationship works. But ultimately, if the, the leader you know, is God forbid sick or can't lead, like you can step in. And I think there's, there's power to knowing that. Um, I'm, I'm like laughing Mm -hmm. because we had an episode um, (laughs) on, on help wanted the other show that I do that I was mentioning um, about this complete crazy snafu that I recently had introducing uh, my partner to this important business person. I don't even know if I can tell this story, but I already started. So, so no, tell, you have to tell it so, now. <laughs> uh, so I'm part of this, this, you know, CEO, CMO group that I've been for, for many years. Um, and my partner is an AI CEO. And I think it would be a great, uh, great group for him to be part of. So I introduce him on email uh, to the CEO. <laughs> of this organization. And I talk about his accolades, but I also don't like hide the fact that, um, you know, we're together because like you want to be transparent, but also like you, this is not just because of me. Like he's amazing. La, 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 la. <laughs> so I send this email and like it has real sentences and like I, I worked for a minute on this email. And so <laughs> I say, babe, um, you know, I sent this thing like take a look. <laughs> <laughs> um did you did you just did you see what the email looked like would you send it and I said no it came from my work email it went to your work email Valeria my significant other is saved in my phone as daddy fun fact when you email somebody <laughs> That is what shows up. Um, that, so it goes to the CEO of this organization and CC's daddy. <laughs> and it shows up as daddy. And we did an episode about this where we call him. And I am like, I'm schwitzing. I can't even like tell this story because it's, it's like so embarrassing. And uh, we call him and I'm like, hey, 
did you notice anything when you got this email? And he starts cracking up. He's like, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know whether to tell you. Like, it's it shows up as daddy. Like, I didn't think other people saw that. I thought that was just for me. Like, I just saved him in my phone that way. No, no. Like, PSA to everyone. If you have your person or anyone saved, like, asshole, do not call. Like, I've had exes saved as, or you know, whatever. You get creative. It will show up if you have their email in that contact in the email. So he now sends me screenshots of like sometimes when they email back and forth and they talk about business, it still shows up on his outlook or whatever as daddy, like daddy's email. He should start. He should start signing (laughs) off as like, thank you for your time, daddy. (laughs) All the have a great week, daddy. (laughs) I think that is one great story and you know what? I, I love that also I didn't know I didn't know that so I that's agree. actually a very yes. important thing to share Complete with PSA. like I literally wrote the book boss bitch but I can also call my man daddy and feel pretty good about it oh my god well that's the beauty right where you can the duality having both your title so you wrote three books I wrote four so far uh the fifth is on the way rich bitch boss bitch four books. becoming superwoman and miss independent so do you feel babies. like, like you why didn't I take book birth control I don't know no why should you get all that information out we all need it uh but when you wrote the boss bitch and <laughs> another bitch. what's the other bitch rich, rich bitch was the first bitch rich bitch I'm like I'm, I'm blanking rich bitch uh, yes when you wrote it was it kind of in the height of like the girl boss era it was before that I started it really like girl boss I think came out after rich bitch came out and so I not the book the era in oh yeah yeah it was in the like, super yes. early it was before like the era um right like I started some of that yeah. that fire and I don't know if it was a good thing because we can talk about it but it like you know morphed into something else yeah I want to talk about it like how do you feel about it looking back (sighs) now well I think for for rich bitch it was really important to call it that um at the time it really disrupted the space that was all male like Dave Ramsey the only woman that was in it was you know Susie Orman at the time and uh the advice that she was giving didn't resonate with me like don't buy a latte you know whatever I was like buy the fucking latte like you know, mm-hmm. uh, there's a, there's another financial way. And I think that it would have been dead on arrival if I called it something really boring, like five steps to financial freedom oh, absolutely. or something like yeah. that, right? And so I wanted it to do something that no other book had done, like reach a young woman who never imagined she picked up a money book, but picked it up because it's like, it's sexy. like has stories and sexy yeah. and all of this, all of that. So I think the ends justified the means. Um, and if, if I could have gotten that to happen, which I did, um, then we win. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, and I dedicated that book to all of the rich bitches out there um, and say that you don't have to be either to be both. And so like really breaking down what bitch meant. And for me, like I was called a bitch in a derogatory sense throughout my career. Um, You know, I started at CNN when I was 21. People were like, your daddy must have made a phone call. I'm like, if you only knew, you know, and people called me a bitch because they meant that I was ambitious and that I was, you know, strong. And not only did I want a seat at the table, but I wanted a voice. And I was like, if that means I'm a bitch, amazing. Like I'm a bitch, call me Mm. like, and I own it as a badge of honor. And so at the time, I think it was really important for me to, to take that word back. Something that had hurt me uh, for so many years and to like own it in that way. Oh, I love that. You see, this gives so much more context to that. That makes sense to me. Thank you. Is there any advice that you have given or shared in those previous books, your first two books, that looking at them now, like I would have, I would change it a little bit. Um, Adjust it to what women are dealing with today or what they need today. Yeah, I think the biggest change was around this idea of being interdependent and not like acting completely as an island because the mm-hmm. independent idea was like that you don't need other people and we, and we do need other people. And I think I would have probably emphasized more in the earlier books this idea of like confronting financial trauma because it's it's so so real and I think it's really the thing that stands in our way. I think the biggest enemy is between our ears. It's not anyone else who's saying anything else. And so like dealing with that uh, for me, it took me to my third book that I even did my own like 
deep work on myself. Um, my third book is about having like a complete burnout and breakdown um, after those after those books came out. Um, and I write about the journey that I went through, hoping that others didn't have to pay the same amount of money that I did to, you know, go through that. And so I think that I would have talked and confronted that a little bit earlier, but I didn't have the tools. And so like, I was doing the best I could at the time. Um, and, and I, and I say in my third book that I, that I also wish that I said a little bit earlier was that change only happens when the discomfort of the present outweighs the fear of the unknown. Mm. And, I, and I think that's, that's really true. Um, you have to get like really uncomfortable for something to change because it's, it's scary. Like getting your, like dealing with finances, looking through stuff, like opening up the credit scores and, and envelopes that I used to have, like piling up. Cause I was too scared. I thought like, also, if I don't know about it, like it's not there. It's like, if you don't step on the scale, like you don't, it's fine. No. Um, and so I, I think that, you know, I, I wish, I wish I would have done some of that like personal work earlier to have that reflected, uh, more in the, the financial, um, advice that I was giving, but I don't regret the fact that it was geared toward women. I think in, in media, as you know, uh, you can't be all things to all people or you're nothing to anyone. Mm -hmm. And so at first, like I had four failed books, like that didn't get off the ground for a, a thousand reasons. Um, but one of them was called like making bank. And I, I stumbled upon it recently and I was like, wow, this would have sucked. <laughs> this would have been <laughs> dead on arrival. Like my God, it was for, you know, fun finance for everybody. But like, I knew at that point exactly who I was talking to. Like mm -hmm. I knew who she was um, and it wasn't for everyone and that's okay. Um, so, so I think that's, that's what I was, I was most proud of, but also, you know, just like anything else, like I wish I had done more of that, like deep, deep personal work. And I say in, in becoming superwoman, um, you know, my, my breakdown wasn't a spontaneous combustion precipitated by a single event, but this lifetime of smoldering embers that finally caught fire and incinerated yeah. everything in its path. Like it wasn't like, you know, cause I self-prescribe not drugs or alcohol, but work to hide from everything. And it, and it caught up with me like it does for, I think everyone. And so coming to the idea that like, it wasn't a book that caused this thing. It wasn't like a job. It wasn't like a guy that caused a thing. It was this like lifetime of crap that finally like caught up with me. Um, mm -hmm. Unattended crap. Unattended crap. Yeah. Got to watch out for that. So true. So how do you move in the world now? Like in your, in your career and just your existence? Like how do you move differently knowing and doing the work that you've done? I think right now, um, I try to just move as honestly as possible. Like I try to um, be really clear that the financial world is changing so quickly and that in, you know, in all of my journey, I figured out that money is a language just like anything else, right? If you go to Japan and you don't speak Japanese, you're going to be really confused. If you go to Wall Street and you don't speak the language of money, you're going to be really confused until you speak the language and you're like, duh, this was easy. This wasn't as complicated, but it's changing constantly. And like mm -hmm. NFTs weren't a thing and Bitcoin wasn't a thing. Like, you know, when, when I was learning this language and it's, it's constantly involving and I'm constantly like confused and figuring it out. I think really, really early, um, I went to journalism school and I'm like, you know, was taught in this world of, you know, all knowing Edward R. Murrow, like anchorman vibes. And, um, I remember getting to CNN and covering the Virginia tech shootings, which was the largest massacre, um, school massacre at the time. And I had students like writing into me, um, asking me for like, what's going on. And at, at that moment, I was like, I, I, I don't know. Like there, there's a point mm -hmm. where you have to just say, like, I don't know. Like, I don't have all the answers. Like, I'm going to try to find them for you. Maybe I have more resources. Um, so I can like tap into those to try to find the best 
answer. Um, but like, I don't know. And that's okay. And even now, like I got all my financial certifications, like I ultimately, you know, did all of those things, but I don't know everything. And, and when I was at CNBC and listening to all these CEOs and politicians come on and like, I remember finally feeling comfortable to like ask them, like, what does that mean? Like, I'm really smart and I know enough about finance. Like, and if I don't get the jargon, I know like a listener is not going to, or a, a viewer is not going to understand it either. And so I think I just constantly try to feel that comfort that like, you know, jargon is the enemy of this world. And if mm -hmm. I can feel that comfort in my skin to be like, I don't understand this, like, and I know enough, um, then I think that like, I'm ult ultimately speaking for those who are too scared or too embarrassed to say they don't know yet. Like it takes a while. Yeah. It took me a while. Yeah. Oh, I, I love that. You know, I had a conversation um, with Cody Sanchez and um, she also has a similar background. She was a journalist and moved into doing what she's doing now. But I just remember when she spoke about curiosity and I thought it was so brilliant how curiosity, we look at it as not really a tool. It's just, it's just never really spoken about. You always think about to become successful. We need all these hard tools to know something, you need all these hard tools, totally. but this soft tool of curiosity, humility, uh, to be able to ask questions and to continue asking those questions. That is, I mean, the biggest um, asset that you can have and the most impact that you can bring because you get to listen and to hear everyone's kind of perspective and stories and answers. And um, I think that's obviously something that you have and that you continue using. It is your superpower. Thank you. Thank you. I, you know, I, I think ultimately I can only give the tools so that everyone can troubleshoot chaos when it happens. It's not if it happens, mm -hmm. it's when it happens. Like, yeah, shit ultimately will happen. So it's inevitable. Uh, it's really like up to you how to use them. Like I can only teach you how to make money, but you're the one that has to get fulfillment out of it, not me. In finance, it feels like a very male-dominated um, industry, which I thought so, but then I Googled and it's not really. Like there's a lot of women in finance. We just don't see them. I mean, there's not a lot on the C-suite, but there are a lot of women in the space. Do you feel that there's, there are? I was on the floor of the exchange when I first started and this was, you know, 100,000 years ago um, when we were still using Blackberries. But- uh, there... Oh, I miss the Blackberry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was one of, I think, two or three women on the- exchange floor like we don't really need exchanges anymore it's not like how it used to be or the open outcry trading you know wolf of wall street style um but that was that was true like that's how it used to be for sure and um i'll never forget that like the uh bathroom uh Usually, like, if you go to a theater or something, the women's bathroom is palatial and the guy's bathroom is, like, a closet. That It was the complete opposite at the exchange. It was, like, the tiniest women's bathroom I'd ever seen with one toilet in there because uh, there was just not an, a lot of women there. And there was, like, a dress code at the time where you couldn't wear heels, like, beyond a certain number of inches. I don't remember what it was. Like, it had to be, like, tiny kitten heels. Um, your skirt had to be, um, like, certain fingers uh, mm -hmm. above your knee or, you know, you had to change or something like that. Like it was, it was really, it was super misogynistic, but like, there was crazy shit that happened. We don't see it as much, um, you know, anymore because we don't see like those types of exchanges and everything is done electronically, but, you know, not having women in the C-suite is, is a really big deal. That's real, uh, representation. If it's like, a, you know, a woman is in a Superman cartoon, female readers don't see themselves represented as that hero. So there need to be con cartoons, right? With like super women in order for them to feel like they're represented. And I think the same thing is with the C-suite. Seeing more of it shows, uh, you know, the next generation, younger women that they can do the same. Yeah. You know what? Yes and no. Um, 
Yes, because yes, obviously you need to see in order to believe and that it's possible. But also, I think that we live in such amazing times where just like yourself, right, you decided that you're going to take what you love to do and what you want to talk about and move away from the gatekeepers of this networks and whatever and create your own. Like today we have those possibilities. And I think that there's a reason why there's not a lot of women in C-suite because it doesn't really work with our kind of progress in life. I mean, we have to, we have the childbearing years, we're building families. Like there's so many aspects to being a woman that men don't really have to think about. So they're able to truly throw themselves into getting to those higher places. But I really believe that those higher places and that environment is not suitable for a woman. Like I think that women are miserable in those environments. Uh, And what I love seeing more and more is what you're doing, where they're like, you know what? I know I'm badass. I know that I have all this information. Let me find a different outlet to put it out, uh, put it out there and to build it in a way that will, you know, work for me. Um, And that way we're like, we're not betraying our own biology and like just inner balance in general. Like that's what I think is going to happen more and more. And we can't deny that today, media, if you have media, if you have the attention, that's what the currency is. So at the end of the day, all these people will come to you to try to get, you know, the attention and to bring forward the issues that they're working on. So I think that there is a better way to get women up there where they can wear what they want and enjoy, you know, while they're building Amen. it. I do think you're absolutely right that there are different considerations for women than there are for men. It's just like, it is what it is. When I was writing uh, Boss Bitch, I have a section for family planning. And I, my editor was like, family planning doesn't belong in business books. I'm like, exactly. It hasn't been done. Like it, you have to have the conversation. It doesn't work siloed. Like it's not your personal life and your career life. It's like your one full life and it has to be planned together. Like you, the, the time when our, you know, biological clock starts ticking, I don't care. Like whether you want 10 kids or 10 cats or, you know, 10 plants, like totally up to you. But like the biology yeah. of, you know, wanting children is, is a certain time period where your career is also on the rise. And so I think looking at these things holistically is super important. And that was like, before it was like, plan your business stuff, like in the business book, business section, and then like plan your family and like the baby section. And it's like, no, 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 we ha- like, You have to, and if you're not happy in one area of your life, you're not going to be happy, period. No, it affects everything. Yeah, of course, of course. That's why I think there needs to be more. We've been failing women in that way. Um, And I started talking about it more and more where, you know, always think back about to the quote. It's not necessarily exactly what I'm trying to get to, but it's, it reminds me of the Marilyn Monroe quote where I don't mind living in a man's world as long as I can be a woman in it. And to me, when I hear that quote is just this realization that we don't need to compete and take the same roadmap that the men take in order to get to where we want to get to, right? Like, And that to me is the future of feminism is, is really stop fighting for that equality in that old fashioned way and finding these new creative ways to get to where we want to in our own, you know, creative ways. Like that to me is where it's heading to. And, um, I, you're the living proof for it, right? You did, you went out there and you just created your own. You didn't wait to continue getting like the thumbs up and, you know, get a promotion and in and, and the network. You're like, okay, I'm going to go and do my own thing. <laughs> well, and here you are. Thank you. F- funnily enough, and, and this sounds superficial, but like I've always had long hair. Uh, they always told me to cut my hair like into a bob to be taken seriously. And that was the thing that I was like, no, I'm, I know what I'm talking about. Like my hair or not like it's gonna be long and suck it (laughs) and and you know that was one of the ways like I remember the hair was always a battle early on there was this class in journalism school where the girls would go in with like beautiful long hair and come out like this like you know I think it was like the Jennifer Aniston thing at the time which by the way looks fantastic on some people on with this babushka face I need like some I need some length like let me live 
So you started your own network, as I do want to talk about it. You started uh, a network. What is it called? Money News Network. Money News Network. What is your vision for the Money News Network? I want it to be like the CNBC of podcasting. So I had my show um, and the other one that I do with the Editor-in-Chief of Entrepreneur Magazine, Help Wanted, um, with a big network that I brokered back a deal to buy back the IP um, and start a network of my own that had control over uh, the brands that we worked with and the advertisers um, that we brought on. Because my biggest fear then when I was under somebody else's control, which is like a business, they're publicly traded companies, they have shareholders and, and boards to to, you know, appease is that like, there would have been an FTX ad or something that I would have mm. read at the time. Like I f- have feel such a deep responsibility. Like it sounds Pollyanna ish, but like, I care so much about her, uh, for our, our podcast, it's more co, uh, co listening, but I care so much about the advice that I'm giving that I can't like read an FTX ad. It's not going to work. And so my goal with starting Money News Network was to deliver what this menu of different financial topics would be in an accessible way. So it's not just me. It's a show that we have from the floor of the stock exchange. It's a show that's focused on options. It's a show that's in English and in Spanish to reach that audience. You know, it, I saw this growing need for this content in a uh in a responsible way. There's a lot of beautiful, amazing TikTokers and uh, social media uh, influencers and extraordinaires out there who give like financial advice. Not all of it is vetted or like responsible. And it really scares me like this rise. It's it's great. Like it's a double edged sword. Like anyone can give financial advice out there uh, or anyone can can have a platform. Uh, but anyone can have a platform. And yeah. so that's that's like really scares me. Um, and so my goal was to make sure that like all of this was the gold standard of advice that you can trust. Um, because I, you know, I just I worry about like these forex schemes and the crypto schemes, like the get rich quick geek. You know, you're like the you know, empress of, of, of what resonates on social media. And it's like, get rich quick, right? Like nobody wants to hear a boring thing. I like my money boring, Valeria. Like I like a fun, sexy time just as much as the next girl. But Absolutely. let me tell you something with my money. I want it boring, like slow, steady. Don't give me like a get rich quick scheme. There's like this dad joke of if you want to double your money fast, like fold it in half. That's the only way. And everything <laughs> else, like you work so hard for your money. It absolutely should return the favor, but it absolutely needs to be done like in the most boring, responsible way. And so I felt like there was a space, as you know, mm-hmm. um, growing, like we haven't missed the the audio boat. It's only growing. Um, and I wanted to put my stake in the ground in a really meaningful way. I really think it's brilliant. I'm really excited to see the amount of impact that you're going to have by creating those spaces and those conversations and vetted conversations. I 100% agree with you. I think that, you know, with social media, I am hoping and manifesting it that at some point we're going to start to have some kind of uh, governing uh, body that will be like, hey, you can make those claims uh, because there is a lot of crazy information. There's, you know, people chasing virality. Um, People love the instant gratification things. So um, I think that it's time to bring back, make, make boring sexy again. Hell yes. Nicole, thank you so, so much. I know we had a little bumpy start, but I had the best time talking to you likewise and you know what sometimes the bumpiest starts end up in the most amazing journey so thanks for taking me on this one thank you i hope i get to see you next time i'm in a likewise thank you so much for watching this episode i hope you enjoyed it don't miss my newest episode right here and if you're listening to the podcast on apple or spotify please go and leave a review with your biggest takeaway i love reading your thoughts And if you have any suggestions for guests or topics, you can leave them in the comment section. And always, always remember, you are not alone.